On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of the sinners to be crucified and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself what had happened. Well, thanks, Amy. Good morning, everyone. Happy Easter. I'm just going to change this microphone. It's still on Matt Rodway's setting, I think. Well, good morning. It's been a great day, hasn't it, already? Um, some of us were here for breakfast. It's been lovely, um, not just celebrating Jesus' resurrection together, but also hearing about how the risen Lord Jesus is at work in our lives. Um, one of the things I've noticed in the lead-up to Easter this year is that in our culture, there is an concre- increasing confusion around Easter, isn't there? I think that's been the case for some time. If you ask lots of people what Easter's all about, you'd hear about bunnies and chocolate eggs. But I think as our culture becomes more post-Christian... You know, the country is asking, what is Easter all about? You might have seen things in the news about, you know, Easter eggs being called gesture eggs in supermarkets or hot cross buns being replaced with a tick instead of a cross. And, you know, in some ways, they're small things, aren't they? But it's a sign that our, our culture is asking questions. What is Easter all about? Is it relevant to all of us? There's a confusion around Easter. And maybe you're here this morning and you're, you're quite new to Jesus. You're quite new to church and you're wondering, what's the fuss all about? You know, what's the big deal about Easter? Well, Easter ultimately is the celebration of an event. It's the celebration of something that has happened in history. And the focal point of this historical event is described in those verses that we just had read from Luke's eyewitness account of Jesus. It's an account of the empty tomb. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning. The empty tomb. God has raised Jesus from the dead. And we saw, didn't we, in that reading, that confusion isn't new. On that very first Easter Sunday, there was all sorts of confusion So let me pray and then we'll dive in together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive and you are present among us now by your Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for this written account of what has taken place in history. And we thank you that these words are not just an account of the past, they are living and active. And we pray that now by your Spirit you would be at work in our hearts. That the wonder and joy and hope of the resurrection, Lord God, would would fill our minds and our hearts again. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, Kim and a a team were very kindly here quite early this morning getting ready for breakfast. I think when Kim offered to help with that, she hadn't quite realized the clocks also go back. So um, it was a very early morning. Oh, yeah, forward, that one. Um, (laughs) You can see that I don't take charge of that in my family. But it just it struck me that actually it's, it was the women here, wasn't it, who were up early in the morning. And, and they were, it, we're told on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they prepared and went to the tomb. Now this group of women, they are, they're faithful disciples. They're women who have been supporters of Jesus' ministry throughout, you know, financially supporting with, with him in significant events. You know, on the Friday, they would have been watching as Jesus was crucified on the cross. And they were up early on that first Easter Sunday. You know, one of the reasons we gather early on Easter Easter Sunday is to remember that day began early. You know, the news of the resurrection broke early. And the first day of the week was a Sunday morning. You know, in the the Jewish um, week, uh, the week ended in the Sabbath, which was a Saturday. So the first day of the week was a Sunday. So 
every Sunday, why do we gather on Sundays as Christians? We gather on Sundays because that is the resurrection day. So yes, on Easter Sunday particularly we, we remember the resurrection, but actually every time we gather on a Sunday, we gather remembering that Christ is risen. And what were the women doing? Well, they're, they're coming to dress Jesus' body with these spices at the earliest opportunity. You know, on the Friday night, they, they'd watch Jesus die in front of them. You can only imagine the emotions, the sadness, the confusion, the pain, the hopelessness. They'd gone with Joseph, this rich man who'd given up his tomb. They'd, they'd seen Jesus being placed in the tomb. And, and that evening, they'd gone back and they prepared the, the, the spices and the herbs to dress the body. But because it was the Sabbath, they then waited. And so they've come down to the tomb at the first opportunity because they want to honor Jesus in death. I, um, I saw a little joke um, on um, social media or someone sent one around. You might have seen it. It'll come up on the screen. Um, it says this. It's Pontius Pilate. Joseph, I really don't understand. You're one of the richest men in the region and you spend a small fortune on a new tomb for you and your family and you want to give it to this man, Jesus. And Joseph says, oh, it's just for the weekend. <laughs> but of course, Joseph didn't know that, did he? When he gave the tomb. None of, none of the people were expecting this to happen. It's, it's so obvious that, isn't it, in the story. That Jesus' resurrection comes as a surprise. The women go to the tomb expecting to find a dead body. They've come with spices to prepare a dead body. They've not come with a, a, a snack. And what they find surprises them. The first thing they find is that the stone, this big stone, has been rolled away from the entrance. Mark, in his account, records that on the way to the tomb, they're chatting with each other about who's going to roll the stone away. But when they get there, it's already gone. But what they don't find there is even more surprising. The tomb is empty. Jesus' body isn't there. There's no body to dress. And they were confused. This is not what they were expecting. And wonderfully, there's an explanation given. You know, there are two angels there to explain what has gone on. He is not here, they say. He is risen. The, the reason that Jesus isn't in the tomb, the reason there's no body, is because God has raised Jesus from the dead. It's a bit like, if you remember the very beginning of Luke's gospel, his account of Jesus, the angels come to the shepherds, don't they? And the angels come to the shepherds to explain to them what the significance is of this little baby who's been born in Bethlehem. It, and it's a scene that looks very normal, but the angels say to the shepherds, what's going on there is anything but normal. They say, today in the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He's God's king, the Lord. And similarly here at the resurrection, the reason for the empty tomb is made crystal clear. God has raised Jesus from the dead. Now, it wasn't that morning, it wasn't just the women who were struggling to get their heads around the empty tomb. Did you notice this detail? You know, they go back and they report, don't they, to the 11 disciples and the others. And I love the honesty of this. It says, but they didn't believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. You know, the women come back with this remarkable news that, that Jesus is risen. There's no one in the tomb. But they couldn't get their heads around it. Now, why? Why the confusion? Why didn't they see this coming? Well, primarily it's because dead people don't come back to life. You know, that was the same then as it is now. You know, when people come back with that news, they'd seen Jesus die. They knew he was dead. They'd watched him be placed in the tomb. And Jesus did speak about resurrection, but probably in their minds, the assumption was that would be on the last day. That would be on judgment day. They weren't expecting a resurrection now. And also, for all the disciples, really their assumption, they were downcast. It looked like Jesus had failed, that the authorities had won, that it was all over, that it was finished. But then they come face to face with an empty tomb and they have to get their heads around what has happened. And it's the same for us. You know, whoever we are this morning, wherever we are with Jesus, we've got to come face to face with the reality of an empty tomb. What do we do with that? And people have different theories, don't they, to try and explain it away. Some say that on the cross, Jesus just kind of swooned or fainted. But the disciples were pretty convinced that he's died. You know, again, the women didn't turn up with breakfast, did they, to bring him round. And how would Jesus in that state have moved the stone? Or some people spread the rumor that the body had been stolen. But what does Peter find when he goes into the tomb? The strips of linen lying there. You know, what thief takes time to unwrap the body? Or maybe some would say this whole thing is a fabricated account. But as you read it, there's so much in here that reads like real life, isn't there? 
And if you're making up this account, you don't paint yourselves as confused and bewildered and missing the point. And in the, the culture of the day, actually, the testimony of, of female witnesses wouldn't have stood up in court. So if you were making this account up, you'd no way the first people to the tomb would be the women. And it might be that for you today, that whole idea of Jesus being raised from the dead seems like nonsense. But the question to you is, how do you explain the empty tomb? And God sent this, these angels to make clear what has gone on. God has raised Jesus from the dead. One thing I found interesting as we look at this account is the women, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? They go from confusion to fear because suddenly there's these two characters blazing in light. You know, often, sadly, we have a slight idea of angels as from Christmas nativities of some little three-year-old with a, you know, a, a tinsel halo. But angels were, were, were fearsome. And suddenly they're afraid. They become aware that something supernatural has gone on here. And Easter is supernatural. Unapologetically a supernatural. God raised Jesus from the dead. And maybe that's kind of where you're at. You know, maybe you're, you, you've started to understand more of who Jesus is. You're becoming more and more convinced by what he claims about himself. And you're starting to get afraid. Because you realize these aren't just stories in an old book. There's something supernatural here. God is really at work in the person of Jesus. And actually you realize that's going to have some implications. That's going to change things. So if we're at the stage of saying, okay, the resurrection's happened, so what? You know, what's the significance of this event from 2,000 years ago? Why does it matter to us today? And again, let's look at that focus. Uh, let's focus again on that explanation that's provided by the angel. I just want to draw out three quick implications. The first is that Jesus is alive. What's the first thing that the angels say? Why do you look for the living among the dead? Um, shortly after we got married, Alice and I um, went to Israel for a summer, and we spent some time in Jerusalem, and we were volunteering at a place called the Garden Tomb, which is one of the possible sites of Jesus' crucifixion and burial. I think there's a picture that might come up. So it's a, it's a garden area, and in it there's a tomb cut into the rock. And if you have the next picture... You know, people would come round and they'd visit, and you'd, you'd take them around the garden, you'd take them into the tomb, but in the end, there's nothing to see. It's somewhat anticlimactic as a tour, because you arrive at the tomb and there's, there's nothing there. It's empty, and you can maybe see on the door, it just says, he is not here. He is risen. You know, we can't go and find Jesus today. We can't go to a tomb or a, or a shrine or a graveyard. He is exalted. You know, after he'd appeared to his disciples in person... He then ascended to heaven. Today, if you want to find Jesus, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. There's a, um, a, a track that I really like at Easter. It's called Jesus is Alive by an artist called Shai Lin. Um, I tried to play the video, but I didn't get to it in time. So I'll put it in the link, maybe in the email, if you want to listen. Now, this is, I didn't write this out, and that's tiny even for me. If we go back a minute. So he, in the track, he just goes through all these famous characters from history. Elvis is dead, Picasso is dead, Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin are dead, Marilyn Monroe is dead, however, Jesus is alive, Plato is dead, Socrates is dead, Aristotle and Immanuel Kant are dead, Nietzsche and Darwin are dead, however, Jesus is alive, Amen. Buddha is dead, Muhammad is dead, Gandhi and Haile Selassie are dead, Elijah Muhammad is dead, however, Jesus is alive, Pharaoh is dead, Cyrus is dead, Darius and Sennacherib are dead. Nebuchadnezzar is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Caesar is dead. Herod is dead. Annas, Caiaphas, and Judas are dead. Pontius Pilate is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Now, if you want to hear that wrapped as it's meant to be wrapped, then I'd, I'd follow the link. <laughs> but, but it's powerful, isn't it? It makes a point. You know, throughout history, there have been all kinds of influential figures, some of whom have done great good. But actually, they've all died or will die. But Jesus is different, completely different, because Jesus is alive. And that means actually the way we relate to Jesus is different. You know, for all those figures that were mentioned, how, how do we relate to them if we want to know them? Well, it's through reading history books, isn't it? It's through reading maybe things that they've written. And obviously, when we come to know Jesus, we do read the Bible. We hear about what he's done. We read his teaching. But actually, the way we know Jesus is different, because he's alive. 
And Jesus invites us, just like the disciples, to know him personally. You know, it's been wonderful this morning to have these baptisms. And those are baptized. What are they saying? They're saying this isn't just something out there, but that actually personally, I know Jesus. I'm, I'm walking in obedience to him. He's part of my life. There's a living relationship with him. You know, when people get baptized, it's not just an intellectual belief, you know, that I hold to these statements. It's more than that, isn't it? it it's an acknowledgement of a personal relationship that we have come to know Jesus ourselves. I think of that with my own baptism. I was baptized when I was 13, you know, a bit like Lee, I'd grown up in a church. But I think it's very possible, isn't it, to be around Jesus and yet for it to kind of pass through. Do you notice how the disciples, Jesus actually has told them after three days he was going to rise again, but somehow they'd heard it, but they'd not grasped it. And it's really, maybe that's your situation. Maybe you've grown up in church or been around church for a long time. It's possible, isn't it, to, to grasp it. Maybe even to say, I believe all that, but somehow it never affects us personally. And I remember part of my getting baptized was a recognition, actually, I couldn't just ride off the faith of my parents. I needed to come to Jesus personally. I needed to respond to God myself. I needed to come to him and invite him into my life. You know, it, if we were to read on in the gospel accounts, what happens next is, is Jesus meets with his disciples, the risen Jesus. And actually, that's what he invites us to do by his spirit, is to meet with him, is to know him. Do you know Jesus? Have you met the risen Lord Jesus? And you might be thinking, Matthew, how? How do I do that? Well, one of the, the words that we were talking about in the, in the baptism was really helpful, that talk about Jesus as Savior and as Lord. You know, come to him as Savior. And that can be a simple prayer. that says, Jesus, I know that your death was on my behalf, and I need your help. I need you to pay the punishment for my sin. I need the forgiveness that only you can bring. I, I want you to pay for what I've done so that I can know you. Come to him as Savior, but come to him also as Lord. Again, come simply in prayer and say, Jesus, I want to follow you now. I've had enough of going my way. I'm going to start to go your way. You know, Jesus is not tricky. You know, as we invite him in, think about the thief on the cross. It was very simple, wasn't it? He acknowledged what he got wrong and he just cried out to Jesus, Lord, help me. So come and meet the risen Jesus. Jesus is alive. Secondly, Jesus is victorious. I want you to imagine for a second a scenario. Imagine that you've gone on a holiday to Australia. Some of you might have had the privilege of doing that. And you're out somewhere kind of in the, you know, along the coastline, um, out in the, in the wilderness, in the outback. Um, and all of a sudden, this huge crocodile kind of comes out of a swamp and lunges towards you. And, it, and it's massive. You know, there's no way you could take it down. And, and it's too close already. And just at that moment, a park ranger jumps in front of you. And the park ranger wrestles the crocodile back into the water. And all you see is that the two of them go under. And there's just quiet. Well, imagine it ended there. You'd be really grateful, wouldn't you, to that park ranger for their expression of love and of sacrifice. But there'd be quite a lot of uncertainty. Who's won? And if he has eaten the park ranger, who's going to protect him when he comes back out of the water? Well, how things would change if 30 seconds later the park ranger pops back up with a smile on his face, a knife in his hand, and you see the crocodile limping off on the other side of the bank, wounded and defeated. Well, at the cross, Jesus went up against far more than a crocodile. He went up against all human opposition. You know, at the cross, Jesus is on his own, isn't he? Everyone is against him. He went up against the anger and wrath of God. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, darkness covered the land, and that was a symbol that all of the punishment that our sins deserve was being poured out on Jesus. He went up against Satan and evil and the devil. He went up against death, this great enemy that no human ruler or leader has ever managed to overcome. Now, if Jesus had stayed in the grave, we might be thankful that he's done that for us, but there'd be a lot of uncertainty, wouldn't there? Did he succeed? Is he still around to help us when we come against those things? But Jesus has resurfaced. You know, death, like that crocodile, is now wounded and defeated. And Jesus is around to help us 
We know the one who has overpowered death, so we don't need to be afraid. Jesus is victorious. You know, the disciples, when we meet them later on in, in Luke chapter 24, we'll look at this next week, they were deflated. They'd hoped that Jesus was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They thought Jesus' rule was now over, but it's not. Because Jesus is a different kind of king. You know, his rule is never going to end. Death can't disrupt him. So often in this world, someone is, you know, a good thing is happening, but it doesn't last long, does it? But not with Jesus. His rule will never end. No one can overpower him. Jesus is victorious. And today is a day to celebrate, isn't it? One of the things I love about Easter Day is it's a day of celebration. Our king has triumphed. He rules over all. He is our champion. The grave couldn't hold him and death couldn't defeat him. So part of what we're called to do today and each day is to worship and praise and celebrate the risen king. The last thing I just want to mention, we've seen that Jesus is alive, Jesus is victorious, is that Jesus is essential. I think one of the reasons people find Easter confusing is that it, it seems when you read the story like everything has gone wrong. You know, Jesus has gone from this popular figure that the crowds love to someone everybody hates. You know, Jesus has been condemned by a court. And he goes humiliated, whipped, naked, beaten, spat at, and he's killed. You know, all that screams at us, something's gone wrong. And at best, the resurrection might seem like God kind of rescuing a bad situation. But the angels make it clear that's not what's going on. Easter was always the plan. Do you see what the angels said? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. You know, Jesus was always planning this. Not just while he was there in Galilee, but before he left the comfort of heaven. Back in Luke 9, verse 22, we have that up on the screen. It says this, so this was um, sometime before the cross. He said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Do you notice that word that keeps coming up? He must, he must. You know, Jesus knew that his death and resurrection wasn't an option. It wasn't an optional extra. He needed to do it. Our world is in a mess, isn't it? You know, you only have to look at the news to realize that. And I'm sure most of us will acknowledge that much of that mess is caused by us, by human beings. You know, if we're being reasonably honest with ourselves, we'd acknowledge that we're a mess. And Jesus has come to rescue us. And Jesus realizes what we really need. See, sometimes we paint the idea that what we need is a better political party. You know, but whatever political party, they can't deal with the mess of this world. Sometimes we think what we need is a scientist or an inventor to bring some new technology which is going to save us. But we need more than technology. Sometimes we think, actually, when we just get through some of these health crises and the NHS discovers a cure, you know, we just need an amazing doctor. Sometimes we think we need a military general that can defend us against our enemies. But Jesus didn't come as any of those. Because Jesus knew the fundamental problem that needed to be dealt with was the barrier between us and the God that's made us. That our relationship with God needs to be repaired. That's the real problem in our world. It, it's our rebellion against God. And because we've rebelled against him, because we've pushed him away and gone our own way, the world is broken. And it's broken in a way that we can't fix. But more than that, we are facing God's judgment because of that rebellion. The punishment for sin is death. That's the problem that he's dealing with. And, and Jesus knew that the only way to deal with that problem was for a representative to come and take our place. We needed someone to become a man and to die in our place, to take the punishment that we deserve so that we could be forgiven. We needed someone to enter into death for us and break out the other side so that the curse of death might be broken. Jesus is essential. You know, we, without him, we can't deal with sin. There's no forgiveness. Without him, we can't deal with death. There's no eternal life. You know, without him, we can't know peace with God. And his resurrection has shown that he's done it. It's worked. 
it might seem a trivial example, but um, this week, Alice and I were, were sorting out our visa for Nepal. A number of us are um, going to Nepal on Saturday. And so we've got to, you know, you have to get a visa so that when you arrive, they'll allow you into the country. And it's one of those very complicated online forms where you can't quite work out if you've done the right thing or pressed the right button or, you know, and you put your bank card details in and you pay the money and then you, you press go or send. And you'll know if you've done that kind of thing, you'll then, there's a nervousness, isn't there? Has it worked? You know, was it successful? And the worst thing that happens in that moment is your screen freezes or something like that or it crashes or, or that little wheel of doom just keeps going round. And it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, when you get that little email or that message that says, visa confirmed. And in the resurrection, we have that message. Jesus' death on our behalf, it has worked. Jesus' battle against Satan and against sin and against death, he has triumphed. We can be assured that actually after death, when we meet the Lord, we will be welcome. He's done what it takes. The paperwork is in order. You know, Easter is the source of our hope, isn't it? Because in Easter, we see the life of the age to come, breaking into this world. And just as Jesus went through death and came out the other side, that's our hope. That when he returns, we will be raised to be with him in glory. And we can trust him. You know, one of the reasons I think it's so important that Jesus declared that this was going to happen. He told his disciples, even though they didn't know what was going on, that he was going to die and after three days rise again is that we can trust his word. He came good on his promise. So when Jesus says, one day I'm going to return and I'm going to call you home, we can trust him. Jesus knows how to deliver on his word. The last thing I just want to end with, you know, in, in application, you know, we've seen that Jesus is alive, so we're invited to come and meet him in person. We've seen that Jesus is victorious, so we're called to worship him. But actually in this one, as, as Jesus is essential, we're commissioned, aren't we, to proclaim him. Easter is a public event. It, it was written on the pages of human history. People saw it and they watched. Jesus appeared before others. And, and our culture, in some ways, is kind of pushing Easter to the side, isn't it? Our culture's confused. And perhaps it's starting to say, well, maybe we need to take this out of the public sphere and this can just be a private thing you do as Christians. But Easter is not a private thing. It's an event in history that has changed the world and it will change the world going forward. And in some ways, it doesn't matter what people put on sticky buns, does it? <laughs> but what does matter is that people know about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's easy, I think, for us sometimes to point at our culture and say, look, they get it all wrong. But isn't that partly because we haven't told them what Easter's all about? Isn't that our job, to tell our culture why this matters, why it's important? You know, the angels were there, weren't they? Why were the angels there? Because if they weren't there, the disciples would have just been left baffled about what had gone on. The angels were there so they would know Jesus is risen. That's why he's not here. And what was the first thing that Jesus, you know, tells his disciples to do? He, he commissions them, doesn't he, as his eyewitnesses. We're going to be looking at the book of Acts this coming term. And we see that the apostles, they are eyewitnesses to the resurrection. That's their job. Their job is to spread this news that Jesus has died and he's been raised. And isn't that our job too? You know, Easter is not a, a private, personal event. Actually, our job is to tell our culture, is to tell those around us that Jesus died and that he's risen and why that matters so much. We're called to be witnesses of the resurrection. Easter then ultimately is an event that has happened. But it's not just something from the past. Jesus is alive today. He's at work in our hearts, and he's going to come back. And the life that we see in him is a life that we look forward to enjoying. Let me pray as we finish together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you can no longer be found in a grave or a tomb. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that right now as we sit here today, you are enthroned in heaven, the supreme king, the Lord of all. Lord, that death cannot touch you, that you are not subject to decay. Lord, that you have been enthroned as the king forever. We thank you that at the cross and in the resurrection, you took on sin 
and took the punishment for us so that we can know forgiveness. We thank you that you took on Satan and overpowered him. We thank you that you took on death and won. And just as the disciples could trust your word that you would be raised as you said you would, so we can trust that one day you will come back. One day we will be raised with new bodies. One day we will enjoy the fullness of the resurrection life that we see here. Jesus, thank you that you are alive and that we can know you personally, that by your spirit, Lord, we can know you not just as a figure from history, but as our living Lord. And Lord, for any this morning who have not yet taken that step, who perhaps their engagement with you is just as words in a book or as a person they're learning about. Lord, would you make yourself known to them? Would you give them courage, Lord, to come to you and seek you? Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshipping you for all that you have done, for raising the Lord Jesus and enthroning him in the heavens. And we pray, Lord, not just today, but every day, Lord, you would give us the privilege of bearing witness to this wonderful event. Lord, we're sorry that perhaps one of the reasons our culture is so confused is because we have been so quiet. And Lord, we pray that through us and in other ways, our culture would again understand the joy and the wonder of the resurrection. Lord, that this event is the most significant event that has happened in human history. It is this event that gives us hope for the future. It is this event that means our faith is not in vain. It is this event that means as we gather, we don't just share nice ideas, but we look forward with certainty to the resurrection that is to come, to the new life of the Spirit. Jesus, we thank you that you will never be usurped from your throne. Lord, your rule and your reign will never end. And we thank you for the great privilege that we belong to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand, and for those of us